Welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I'm your host, Dr. Jose Antonio. And filling in for Dr. Tony Ricci today is my co-host, Katie Emerson. She's, uh, she's a registered dietitian and she's a manager of scientific affairs at Nutrition 21, not to be confused with Nutrition 20 or 22. Um, she's currently pursuing a PhD in human and sports performance at Rocky Mountain University. Now, if you're a first time listener, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you like the show because it's an awesome show. Uh, we're on YouTube, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Today, our special guest is Dr. David Church. He's an assistant prof at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He's in the Department of Geriatrics College of Medicine. I assume he works with older adults. Um, Dr. Church completed his postdoc training in stable isotope tracer methodology under the tutelage of Drs. Arnie Frando and Robert Wolf. His primary research focus is, and I love this term because only academics use it, ameliorating catabolic and pathological conditions. I mean, Katie, who uses the term ameliorate other than like a few academics? Like nobody, but Church had to put it in his bio. And so I had to freaking say it. So it makes him sound super smart. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're a meathead, you got to do all you can. I mean, David, you couldn't have used lesson, huh? It had to be ameliorate. No, that's a good point. I should probably switch it up the next time I'm asked for a bio. I'll just say, make better. <laughs> make it better. No, but exactly. look at the conversational starter. So yeah. no, leave it. Yeah. Um, oh, I do want to mention that we've had, I think we've had everyone in your lab. We had Dr. Shai, can't pronounce her last name, won't butcher it. We had Dr. Ferrando. Um, apparently, Arkansas is the place to be. Unfortunately, Katie decided to move back to Florida. I don't know why, you know, might be the beaches, the beautiful weather. You know, uh, and she's going to learn how to paddleboard, hopefully. Yep. Um, I got a few boards. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, Dr. Church, uh, you gave a presentation at ISSN on the impossibly nasty, tasty burger, right? Now, before you talk about that study and before Katie, I know Katie says, uh, before you even came on, Katie's like, I love that burger. It's like the best burger ever, like ever, better than Kobe beef burger. I was like, really, Katie? She's like, yeah, I swear. Um, so. <laughs> I believe my comment was, am I allowed to say shit on the podcast? Because that's what the burger is. <laughs> <laughs> so you are allowed. Um, so yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna rattle off what's in the burger. And then, and then you're going to tell us, uh, David, how you came up with the idea of doing a study on it, how you carried it out, et cetera, et cetera. So in the burger, let's see. Uh, we have water, soy protein concentrate, coconut oil, sunflower oil natural flavors. I love that. 2% or less potato protein, methyl cellulose, yeast extract, cultured dextrose, food starch, modified food, food starch, and soy leg hemoglobin. What the hell is that, David? Soy leg hemoglobin. Before you, you got to tell us what that is before you even start. I'm pretty sure that's their, uh, that's how they make it look a little bit more like a beef burger. Um, <laughs> Okay. What's what's ironic about uh, the study was that most people, we had three groups. You know, we had a four ounce beef patty, a four ounce impossible patty. So you kind of had a direct comparison, <clears throat> and then this will lead into the, the how we developed the study. But we also had like an eight ounce impossible burger group, and pretty much everyone wanted into the eight ounce impossible burger group because it's just more calories. And the context behind these studies when we do these infusions is they come in on a 10 hour fast. And then we need you to fast for like four more hours so we can get a quote unquote basal rate. So by the time you get any food, you've not eaten in 14 hours. So pretty much everyone thought all the burgers tasted fine at that point, but uh, <laughs> so no no one was complaining at all in the study in that regard. But um, now the the study came about, I think uh, Dr. Wolf is actually the the, P, the PI on the, on the grant. I helped him write it and felt um, you know, these commodity groups come out with calls every year. So we, we had this idea of like, well, let's compare the impossible burger, the beef burger. And, um, when I, I told the story at the conference, but now I guess it can be documented on YouTube. But when I was like writing the, the grant, I was like, oh, this is going to look really nice. Cause the, the breakdown of the essential amino acids, which our group has shown seems to be the primary stimulator of MPS, uh, it appears to be about half the amount uh, and the possible burger is beef. So beef would have like eight or nine and the impossible burger would have like four, four and a half. And I was like, oh, let's, let's do an, a beef burger 
one impossible burger and then a double impossible burger. So we'd have an ISO nitrogenous comparison and like an ISO EA comparison. And <clears throat> science changes and it changes quickly in nutrition, ironically, uh, between writing that and then getting the data and working on it, a, a paper came out where they actually measured the breakdown. Like before that, you were kind of guessing the EA composition based off the ingredients that you rattled off there earlier. But there's a group, Fagnelli, I think it's Stein is the corresponding author, but Fagnelli is the lead, if I'm saying it right, um, where they actually measure the, the protein content, the amino acid content, and I ended up being a little bit wrong. That, you know, in their study, they had the beef burger at like, I think it was nine grams of essentials. I have it here real quick. I think they had it at nine grams of, 10 grams of essentials, and then they had a impossible burger at seven and a half. And when I saw that, I was like, oh no, I've made a huge mistake. Uh, and that meant, because that meant the eight ounce impossible burger had 15. So I was like, now I don't have a comparison at all. But ironically, despite that, you know, pretty similar profile, which was good to see, um, we still got divergent results. You know, as I presented at the conference, um, only the four ounce beef burger and the eight ounces of the impossible burger, so two patties, <clears throat> stimulated muscle protein synthesis, whereas the single impossible burger, despite having seven and a half grams of EAs, which is a reasonable amount, um, <clears throat> uh, did not stimulate MPS above like basal rates. And when you looked at the change, you know, so we, you're fed muscle protein synthetic rate and you subtract out your, you know, that 14 hour fasted rate. And you just look at the change between the groups, um, both the four ounces of beef and the eight ounces of the impossible burger were a significantly greater change than the four ounces of the impossible burger. So I got a little lucky on that one, but it certainly, uh, you know, the whole point was that, that we were trying to make is that they're not a one-to-one -one replacement from a metabolic standpoint. How much, wait, how many total grams of protein was in the smaller burger? Impossible. It's supposed to be like 20 grams, but the study, the Fagnelli study measured about 21 grams of protein. And you got no response? None. No. Wait. And it, it's, and that's, not, we're not the first ones. I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at some, even soy protein concentrate studies where they do it as a drink, they don't necessarily get a stimulation of NPS. Um, that said, on a, like we've shown, you know, uh, we did a study, I think it was published in 2000, 2021 in German nutrition, where we showed of all the, uh, of all the plant proteins, soy gave a really good response at the whole body. Did you say soy? Soy? Yeah. Yeah. Soy protein. And that's what the impossible burger is. It's mostly soy. So it's, it's still a really good uh, source of protein. It's just, you need more of it to stimulate muscle proteins. Particularly, you know, if you're going to be vegan or vegetarian, it's probably as good as you're going to do. Um, to be fair, if you're vegetarian, eggs and dairy would be the easy way to do it. But yeah, I mean, it's still a reasonable source of protein, and we've shown that. But just at, at the muscle level, it takes more to get that response. So even with 20-something grams of protein, not a damn thing. Uh, well, yeah, that... but you know this. The grams of protein is a red herring at the muscle level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could give you twenty grams of of you know, you know, glycine. It's yeah, well, that right. Be yeah, but I could give you, I could give you five grams of essentials, and I could get a robust muscle protein synthetic response. So it's really the muscle level. It's really about what we've shown, at least in our lab, is about getting the essential amino acids out into the plasma. And so yeah. that means you got to have enough of them in a source, and they got to be bioavailable. But but it still had essential amino acids. That's the thing. right. So it seems if you look at the literature on soy, it seems like uh, there's a greater splenic splenic uptake. So like the GI system is taking up more of those essential for whatever reason. That is well beyond my physiology area of interest. Um, but it seems <laughs> to be taking it up. It's not that it's not interesting. It's just like there's only so many hours in a day, and it's better for someone else to answer that question. Uh, but for whatever reason, it seems like more of the amino acids are from from these from soy gets taken up into the GI system, and therefore not as much of it gets out into the plasma. And in fact, that's what we saw. Even the double impossible didn't get as many plasma essential amino acids out into circulation as the beef, the four ounces of the beef patty. Despite remember, two impossible patties has 15 grams of essential, and one beef patty only has 10 grams. So it, it, the, the only reasonable explanation there is that it's being taken up in the gut. 
Right. And I think this is a, a really cool way to explain to people because I know Cassie, myself, as a di as dietitians, we constantly have the conversation around animal versus plant protein. And you can say all day till you're blue in the face, you know, there's a major difference between bioavailability, digestibility, you know, if you're looking mm -hmm. at the amino acid scores, cool. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about now where the essential amino acids are being absorbed, the gut, you know, the bloodstream, where is it going? This is a great study to reference when you're talking to your ve vegetarian and vegan friends, because when... I mean, I think I got into an argument with some random person on social media the other day when they're like, no, it animal protein is just a fraction less than plant uh, than uh, plant protein. I'm like, or, or more. And I'm like, no, 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 there's there's a significant difference. You know, it, it's not black and white. And so studies like this help to kind of clarify a little bit more of how much we don't know and how much more um, exploration we should have. Yeah. Yeah. And the. First off, I avoid social media arguments. I leave that to you guys. Um, but you're missing out on a lot of fun, David. Come on. Yeah, you know, I actually have admitted this that when when people tag me or they ask me a question on social media, I, I tag more senior investigators in the field, and I, I let them. That's cheating. It. That's cheating. <laughs> it's fine. I just don't. I don't have time for it. Um, but that way, the question still gets answered. You know. They, I could see how that would come about in a social media argument and they're not like technically wrong. But what's interesting is there's like these dyads or digestibility of individual amino acids. And what's interesting is we use a tracer called phenylalanine, D5-phenylalanine and long story short, it's like a neon light, right? It goes to the same places that light goes, but it looks different and we can measure it. Um, I stole that from Dr. Ferrando. So that's where that comes from. But I think it's a really good explanation of what a tracer is. And uh, and in those two, in the beef and in the Impossible Burger, they have the same amount of feed content. So it made for, you know, a beautiful comparison from a nerd tracer standpoint. But their digestibility score is measured by DIAZ, which is the gold standard led by Paul Mon in uh, New Zealand. Uh, they're identical. So the problem isn't, you know, that's my point on the social media argument. They're kind of right. When you look at the, when you look at the digestibility scores, they are correct that the digestibility score is only a little bit lower with vegetable proteins, like good quality vegetable proteins compared to animal proteins. But the problem is that those scores aren't very good. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You try to explain that to someone who doesn't understand and it, you finally do, you know, give up the fight and say, okay, I'll let you have this one. It's not worth my time. But it's, it's studies like this that kind of help to explain why it's not so easy to understand. Yeah, and, and we're certainly not the first, you know, there's multiple studies, you know, Nick Bird's got some, Stu's got some, uh, I think Wilkinson's the first author on them where they compare soy and milk to various different things and, you know, milk uh, has higher, you know, acute anabolic responses uh, by, you know, MPS, and in fact, I'm pretty sure there's an AJCN paper showing that milk, some type of milk or whey protein supplementation resulted in greater lean body mass gains for 12 weeks compared to soy. So, I mean, we're not the first ones. Data have been there forever. Um, and it generally seems like if you want to get the same response with, you know, uh, plant proteins, you just got to take in more. So at least it's a simple solution. Yeah, double it up. Or yeah, I mean, you can do it. You just take in more. Question. Um, when you look at these acute MPS studies, um, the analogy I use is, is it would be like watching the first inning of a... Uh, uh, pitcher, major league baseball pitcher or softball pitcher, and trying to make some deduction over how they'll pitch in the seventh inning. Um, at the end of the day, you have to do a time course study looking at lean body mass changes um, because it, that's all that really matters. MPS, I, as Doug Cummins says, no one's ever won a gold medal for the highest MPS, right? Um, yeah. At least, at least I don't think it's in the Olympics yet. You never know; it might be. And and you and Arnie would be like, in, you know, the front there for. Well, we'd be good at measuring it. We wouldn't necessarily have high rates. That's okay. That's true. So since humans eat mixed meals throughout the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and multiple snacks, does it matter if they're eating an impossible burger or a beef burger? Well, I guess if they're eating an impossible burger, they're probably not meat eaters, right? I mean, who the hell would eat that crap? Right. That's what's so funny about them. That That's what I was going to ask David too, is like, if you guys did any like a uh 
like subject feedback on like why they would prefer the beef over the impossible burger besides the obvious fact that they don't eat animals because the people I find that like these burgers are the ones that are like ooh soy is bad you know it's really going to mess up my estrogen levels because it's phytoestrogen and then oh it's got sunflower oil so it's inflammatory when all of that just seems you know if you're if you're eating an, a plant-based burger for health reasons and then you break down the ingredients like Jose did it kind of doesn't make sense to me so I don't know if anyone in the study maybe gave you some feedback or thoughts exactly no, they didn't. And I tend to avoid telling people what I do for a living. <laughs> okay. just, Come on, Dan. Fair enough. I just, well, I mean, we could probably speculate. There's probably a solid group of people that are actually ve vegan and vegetarian, which I mean, it, ve vegetarian, to be fair, probably isn't too difficult to do. You can do milk and eggs and, and I'll be the first one to admit, I get a little lost on some of the rules. Um, some people define <laughs> it differently. Even well, I do still see the social media arguments. And even within uh, the vegan camp, there's different, I see some that are okay with eating, is it mollusk? You know, like the, the mm -hmm. some, yeah, and, and some are not. So Those I, I are get, alive. Yeah, I get lost on where different lines are drawn, but just how we traditionally think of a vegan and vegetarian, to be fair and make this simple. You know, vegetarian, you know, that, that that's pretty simple to do with dairy and eggs. <clears throat> But they probably still would like to eat an impossible burger, so they feel like they're eating, you know, a hamburger. And and you could probably say the same about the vegans. And there's probably another group of people that are are interested in decreasing either their animal protein intake or their their red meat intake, mm -hmm. but still want to feel like they're they're eating something like that. And you know, you do see the data. The data does support that texturally. I believe it's texturally that it gives a reasonable mm -hmm. the impossible burger gives a reasonable imitation of some of the mechanics in the mouth of a beef patty. It does. I forget. Yeah. I oh, forget you have it. I've never tried it. Uh, okay, so I, I tried it only because I went to we went to the Keys on vacation with a ton of friends, and they exactly what you said, David. They they're not vegan, they're not vegetarian. You know, they eat meat, but they want to reduce the yeah. amount of red meat, but they still want that texture of yeah. eating a burger. But the argument that we were having is, I was like, you do realize like it's not healthier for you than a regular burger. It's just less fat. You, you you can eat a bison burger yeah i, I mean there's other options so I, I just find the 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 concept just very interesting but i did try a bite i'm just going to eat beef just not every day yeah well i think their market share has gone down too recently i'm not entirely sure i i i, I um at the time that we were funded to do the study i think they were doing quite well i haven't looked at the financials of the company once again there's limited day, time in the day but i don't think they're selling as well as it used to but those would probably be the people that would that would eat it in the camp. And then I'm sure there's plenty of they're like, I don't know, I just ate it and I liked it and I, I keep eating it. You know, like not not everyone thinks about food as much as we do. I mean, even when I started off my career in science, I was an exercise physiologist that fell into nutrition. I didn't think about food that much. I was just like, there's food, I need to eat it to perform better theoretically. Uh, whether that happened or not was a different story. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that just are like, I don't know, I like it, I buy it. And, and that's it. So I think those are the camps. Um, most people didn't really have any complaints and no one really gave us a reason as to why they were, you know, every, everyone in the study was either willing to be in either group, right? Because we just randomized in whatever group they got. So no one really had like a reason why they do it or not. So give us for the audience, um, the, the people who are lazy in the audience, give the one minute summary, the elevator pitch of, of what you found and I know you don't want to do this, but recommendations for the Impossible Burger. Uh, I mean, it's pretty simple. You need, um, you know, they're not they're not one for one equivalents. The the from a metabolic standpoint, and Stefan Van Vliet shown it. Uh, he did a met metabolomics analysis on the actual patties themselves and, and showed they were you know different compounds are present in both. So even metabolically, they're not a one for one replacement. Um, and that you just need two, you need double the amount of impossible burger to get the same uh, anabolic response at the whole body level and the muscle level as uh, uh, four ounces of beef. And and double is, I assume that's double the calories. I'm not sure what the caloric content is of a regular burger. Is it double? Using the that same, yes. Using that same study that I was citing for the protein and the EA content, they, the calorie content was 285 calories for uh, four ounces of beef and eight ounces of the impossible burger was like 600 or sorry. 585. 
Wow. So, <laughs> so while they're feeling healthy, they're getting fatter, is what you're saying, David. That's what I heard. At least that's what you said before we started recording. The fat vegetarian <laughs> and vegan, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, right. I mean, more volume of food is going to be more calories. There's no way around it. And, you know, they, they do a pretty good job of making it. If you look at the macros, it's a reasonable replacement for the beef. If you just look at the macros, it's, you know, it's like 290 calories for Impossible Burger, about 285 for a beef bag. They're both 20 ish grams of protein. Beef has, you know, about three to four more essentials than, than it. It just, there's something about it, might be all those binders they're using in there to keep it together. And it's just the essential amino acids they're not getting out there. Because in the study, what we saw was the maximal amount of EA concentrations in the plasma predicted the anabolic response. So hmm. there's just something about patty that the protein's not even getting out there. Yeah, well. It's a loss. It's a big L for the fake food industry. That's all I got to say. So yeah. would your recommendation be if you're trying to be a bodybuilder? Don't I would, I would, maybe, I, would, I would maybe eat an egg with it. Uh, or, or egg, like a, there you go. That's a good option. Yeah. Or like a glass of milk or like, or, you know, the essential amino acids can be sourced like crystalline essential amino acids can be sourced vegan. So, you know, I, I want to, I, I, I immediately thought of like, okay, well, how can we improve the impossible burger? Everyone else always goes like, ah, oh, you know, win, right. They think of their tribe, but I was like, well, I can make this better. And so <laughs> the first thought I, I had was like, can I take four ounces of that impossible burger and put in like crystalline amino acids, um, like church word vein did. And I think it was like journal of nutrition study back in like 2011, he took like six grams away and they put in either like 3.5 grams of BCAs or something. And they got equivalent response to like 25 grams away. So could you not do the same thing, right? Just take, you know, Arnie drinks essential amino acids all day. Yep. So could we not just put in like three or four grams of essential amino acids in a the burger and get the same response? So I think if you're a bodybuilder, that's, that would be the way to do it. You would think, yeah, you would think, although not many bodybuilders would probably choose the impossible burger, but I'm sure there's a niche. I'm sure after the the game changers came out, many were like the Impossible Burgers. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, just take, just take some essential amino acids with it, you know. Or if if you could, eat, you know, like if you want people to eat less meat, maybe maybe if some people are willing to meet, eat some more milk or eggs or something, you know. I was told recently there's a way that eggs can be vegan, so you know, there you go. I don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm lost on the whole thing. Hmm. <laughs> I, hey, I don't what? know what to say to that. Yeah, I think I think you're just safer eating, having some some crystalline essential amino acids. It's like a little crystal light with your Impossible Burger, and it would probably rescue the response. Okay, let's uh, let's switch over to one of my favorite topics, testosterone. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, um, you had a couple of papers, but I want to give tell you a short story on a paper, a review paper I co-authored in 1996. How old were you, Katie, in 1996? Ten. Okay. So, uh, so David, you're quite young as well. So, but I'm in grad school at the time and I have a couple friends and we're just meatheads. We go to the gym and we're reading, I don't know if you remember the textbook, Goodman and Gilman, the pharmacological basis of therapeutic. Oh, yep. yeah. It, it is, it was the, I don't know if it is, but it was the Bible of medical school. Then uh, I was in grad school. I knew a lot of the medical students and the faculty in the medical school. And going through that, I realized that the, the section on androgens was just totally wrong. Like, it was just wrong. And we're just three grad students reading it. We're like, these guys have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I'll summarize it. They said that anabolic steroids or androgens cause a whole litany of cancers, cause this, cause that. It doesn't have an ergogenic effect. It doesn't promote the gain in lean body mass. I'm like, wow, these guys are wrong. So we wrote a review paper published in 1996, Canadian Journal of Applied Physiology. They changed their name after that. And here's the kicker. It was actually rejected by every journal. Seven journals rejected it. And back then, David, you'll get a kick out of this, Katie. It was done by snail mail. There was no email. We had to wait for the damn letter. And I remember, I'm like, we got the seventh rejection. I'm like, nobody wants this paper. But here's the, here's the, the funny part. They didn't reject it based on science. They rejected it based on politics. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I'm like, and in fact, it would be in the letter. Well, we agree with your paper. We just can't publish it. Mm. So the yeah. Canadian Journal of Applied Physiology rejected it. 
they came back later, like they sent a letter like three months later and they changed their minds like, oh, by the way, I think we're going to publish your paper. Right. The paper basically said this, there are certain androgens you could take, and this is for healthy males, there are certain androgens you can take at certain doses for certain durations, and basically you'll get bigger, faster, stronger without any side effects. That, that was basically the summary. And then in that same year, Shelly Bassin's group with, um, uh, what's his name, Tom Storer, uh, they published that paper in 1996, New England Journal of Medicine, testosterone and anthe, 600 milligrams a week for 10 weeks, has no side effects in normal healthy males. And here's the kicker. Even the guys who didn't exercise got bigger muscles. Yeah. So <laughs> that's sort of the backdrop. I decided to leave that area as an area of study. Here's why, because nobody gives a shit about data. When it comes to testosterone or androgens, they don't care. They have their minds made up. And that's why when I see studies like this, I'm like, wow, this stuff is really cool. Too bad no one cares. <laughs> Except me. <Yeah. laughs> so David, that is my little preamble. Tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done. Because um, I think this stuff is cool. Yeah, you're just getting me in trouble all over the place today, right? Also burger, testosterone, you know, we'll solve it, we'll solve it all. But uh <laughs> I, I I was a small, to be fair, I was a small part of this one. My uh uh the lead author is Alyssa Varanowski, and she directed the the project under uh Stefan Pasiakos like direction. And Arnie and I played, you know, Arnie was a I think a co-I with Stefan on that, but you know, we we played a our small role in it. But uh Alyssa ironically was right behind me and my PhD. So we had the same mentor and advisee team <clears throat> at the University of Central Florida. So it was kind of fun to get an extra two years of, of working with her. And she's a she's a NASA doing cool stuff now. So who was so, your PhD yeah. advisor again? Who was it again? I was at UCF with uh, Dr. Hoffman and, and Dr. Oh. Stout and Dr. Fukuda and Matt Stock. We kind of it was kind of a team committee, so to speak, approach down there. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so Alyssa was right behind me. So she's the lead author and and I have a paper coming from it too where we we have the muscle protein kinetics in it but she kind of has like what you're talking about earlier about what really matters in terms of uh, the performance and the function and we did it at, at pennington biomedical research center and i say that because for, for like listeners that don't know it's like the gold standard inpatient studies like it's a super core facility i got to go down there and see it and it's incredible and everything is controlled so like you know there's three phases of the study Phase one was kind of like the run-in where we did all their baseline testing, their, their free living. And phase two, we did this is when they went to Pennington full-time and they're inpatient for 20 days, 21 days. Um, and then there is a phase three where it's kind of like at home recovery, ad libum on your own. So the point is, is during phase two, right? That was completely controlled, like as much as it could be like sleep, food they're getting, activity, constantly being monitored, et cetera. I mean, it, it was... Um, it's an amazing study in that regard. And what so what we did was, like I said, there's the phase one where we got all their baseline measures, performance measures, body comp. We, you know, we did the uh, muscle protein synthesis and breakdown. Um, and then we did whole body synthesis and breakdown. <clears throat> and uh, we only did the muscle side in the, in the basal state and the rested state. And that's fine with testosterone because that seems to be where it works. It doesn't really seem to work with the feeding aspect. Um, so we did that all. And then once they got to Pennington, we started that phase two period that was like to simulate uh, sustained operation. And they really beat these people up. Um, it was all males for obvious reasons. And the backdrop of it is, is when, if you look at the data, generally speaking, at these large energy deficits, sleep restriction, high, high energy expenditure, all that. And you look at Brad Nindle's work right from the Army Ranger training, they all become hypogonadal. So the important thing is we were trying to see if we could replace it. Now, I, I, you say they all become hypogonadal? Uh, if you look at like Brad Nindle's work, okay. um, and if you look in, in this study, there's a the, the average for sure is uh, hypogonadal. And I believe in, in, in Brad Nindle's work with the Ranger training, I believe, uh, I think they all became hypogonadal. I don't think he had anyone that was in normal range. Um, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. And so the point is, is like even in apparently young, healthy men, you make the stress load, the catabolic stress load high enough, they'll become hypogonadal. So the idea is, well, can we just replace what they're off, do testosterone replacement therapy and, and have them be better operators, right? Better, better, better soldiers. <clears throat> and so during that inpatient period, 
that we it was prescribed a 55 percent energy deficit diet which uh, i believe the lowest we usually see is about 40 percent and you're able to maintain muscle mass so we were well well past that 55 percent is pretty aggressive and then on top of that if that wasn't enough every two nights so like you know night one night two you get normal sleep at night three and night four and night five so three nights in a row you get sleep restriction for four hours so they're underslept underfed underslept underfed overworked oh God. because it, because they're also you know they're out on rucks and and the, so it's the it's the exercise and diet induced energy deficit of, of we were aiming for 55 percent and so yeah we did that for like 20 days 21 days and then at the end of that we assessed you know all the performance metrics all the all the fancy isotope work this, this that and the other and then then they got another 20 so days free living and assessed it all at the end. It kind of kind of simulate like they go out on a mission, right? And they, they do these repeated military missions while they're out. Then they come back and they're they're recovered, they're, they're recovering, you know, eating what they want to eat. We didn't control their food or anything. Um generally speaking, what we saw was that the testosterone group held on to fat-free mass and lean body mass better than the placebo group. And interestingly, body mass loss was similar between the groups, but the placebo group lost more of it as muscle, whereas the testosterone group lost more of it as fat. Um, and that was mirrored by the, the protein kinetics. We saw that um, uh, the testosterone group had significantly reduced muscle protein breakdown um, in, in the basal state as compared to the group that got the placebo injection. And, and, and so that probably explains what we, we saw you know, the, the preservation of fat-free mass and lean body mass was this improvement in, in muscle protein kinetics. But the, you know, at the end of the day, what mattered was kind of the functional parameters. And, and we didn't see any improvements in the uh, functional parameters, like a three-arm deadlift, you know, VO2 testing, ruck march time, you know, like pragmatic military uh, outcomes. And we didn't see any improvements or any sustainment of those performance metrics in the testosterone group as compared to placebo. So, yeah. What was the dose of testosterone? This was testinanthate? Oh, yeah, it was the, no, it's testosterone uh, undecanate because the idea is it's got like a 12 week half life, you know, so you to single injection, you know, 750 megs. So 700 megs to cover how many weeks? It was 20, 21 days, so three weeks. Right. That's not a, not a bad dose. It's not a lot. No, it's not a lot. Remember, the idea was testosterone replacement. And I'm trying to remember. I remember that during during the actual phase two, that inpatient period, and we we're really beating them up. I remember total testosterone concentrations in the group that got testosterone were were significantly elevated over their their resting state. So it it maintained testosterone concentrations. Would you happen to know off the top of your head what the T levels were on the group getting the placebo? How low it got? Uh, I don't. I mean, know. Well, I'm right? So. I don't know off the top of my head. I remember when I talked to, I'm trying to remember, because we measured free in total, and this right. sounds bad. You can't remember your own publications, but uh, you know, it's always one of these things. You write the grant, and then you wait, and you get the study, and then you do the study, and then by the time you write the paper, it's like, well, it's been a year since we've done the study. So I can't remember off the top of my head if that placebo group got hypogonadal or not, um, but that would be a reasonable explanation. So, Katie, what dose of testosterone do you take? Did you tell the audience? <laughs> well, it depends. I might I might join your study. I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to get. Am I going to get the testosterone booster? Or am I going to get the placebo? Yeah, that's kind of it's kind of what Arnie and I always said. Like, if you're going to do that study, what group did you want to be in? Well, you only want to be in the testosterone group. Absolutely. But then, I mean, how do I? I can't break the blinds, but. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. And I'll say. I'm sorry, Dave, you've done some work looking at testosterone and, and the cognitive function as well? Some, but, you know, my, we just, so we, you know, we're, we've done it in terms of like, we found that like bioavailable testosterone seems to be related to these various domains of cognition in older men. And that was like an in Haynes like analysis, but what's some of the more interesting work that uh, we're trying to work on is, is like testosterone normalization and recovery uh that seems to be the more interesting thing so if you look at like um individuals that get mtbi uh they obviously have cognitive impairments but they also a large portion of them become hypogonadal i forget the number but it's like 30 or 40 percent become hypogonadal 
which is something you don't ever think about, right? You're always thinking about the head, but they become hypogonadal. out. And there's there's studies that actually, you know, will will look at, you know, the use of testosterone in these patients. So it's not like we're doing anything completely new, but one of the things we've we've seen in rodent models is that uh, the, these blast injuries, there's if you use an actual like a T and C analog versus um, a lot, we'll use like a hammer on the head of these rodents, which is a much different impact than like yeah, what. In that model, it's yeah, crazy. <laughs> it's like crazy. <laughs> and I, I know of a researcher that tries to do a similar thing in humans where they're looking at MTBI and they launch like soccer balls at it. And I was like, You got that through an IRB, so you know, I mean, there's different ways of doing it, but it's not, oh, yes. I, I, I remember reading that to, to, yeah. to at least mimic what happens in the soccer game, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I'd sign up for that study, but. I mean, the point being, the point being is that, uh, you know, on top of that, all, all, all that sequelae I mentioned, if you look at um, Dr. Elizabeth Forsheim, who did her postdoc with Barney, Ar Barney, there we go. That's what I'm starting calling him, Bob and Arnie. Um, she looked at uh, plasma essential amino acid concentrations after ingesting, you know, oral essential amino acids in, in individuals that had mild TBI, and they have a lower uh, essential amino acid response to these this crystalline amino acid ingestion. So they're, they're showing signs of not only being hypogonadal, but being a little bit anabolically insensitive to nutrition. So you kind of got the, the worst of both worlds there. So we're, we're, we're trying to go down that path and seeing if we can normalize testosterone. Can that, you know, maintain the signal uh, to the to the, the machinery and the muscle in order to maintain muscle mass and, and, and quality of life and get this TBI. And then it does, it does seem like the testo might, in fact, make them more resilient uh, from a, from a cognitive standpoint as well, but that's not near as well. Would it make women more resilient if they engage in sports like MMA, soccer, and they oh. get TBI? I have no clue. I mean, I, I did, a, I did a lot of BDNF work in my PhD. And it's really interesting that testosterone and estrogen seem to have like pretty prominent roles on how that all comes out and brain with F. And by the way, in, in MTBI patients, you see you see lower plasma BDNF uh, values. But I would caution people from over interpreting BDNF in the blood because it, there's a lot going on there. But I don't have the slightest idea hmm. how it react in in women. Yeah, that's a good question. What we're gonna what Katie and I are gonna do? I'm gonna throw soccer balls at her head, and she's gonna take some anabolic steroids, and we're gonna do our own like. Uh, case study, right? Right, Katie. We'll start tomorrow. I'm in. Yeah, we can. We, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, do some, we'll do some cognitive tests as well, different areas of the brain. Yeah. Test PDNF as well. I'm. I'm. Use me as a lab rat. I'm all for learning. Yeah, because that, that might be an area where you see a true like uh, sex based difference. Is that Absolutely. maybe the estrogens estrogens more protective in women and testosterone is more protective in men or something? But yeah, yeah you know, I because. Clinically, I can't give testosterone to women, so I only ever think when I'm thinking in the context of testosterone, these things is like, okay, well, I got to find something that's predominantly like that, that they can use to men. Um, and uh, yeah, I, honestly, I didn't think of that angle. I know what it'll do to the muscle in a woman. Well, so um, I started to read your your paper, and I didn't get very far into it. Um, uh, me either. Abstract, abstract was read, and the introduction was read. But the the one where you're talking about the cognitive areas that you tested with testosterone, I think you there was like five different tests and only one showed back that it was significant. I was trying to pull it up. I must have deleted it on accident. But do you remember which one was significant versus the other ones? And do you, do you know which area of the brain? Because you know, like some of these cognitive tests are really focus on the hippocampus. So it's like the learning and memory center of the brain. I'm just trying to pinpoint maybe testosterone is going to a particular place working since not all of them came back significant. Do you know where I'm going with this? Oh yeah. yeah. I know the digital symbol substitution test, the DSST. I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that one either. Yeah. yeah. I almost forget what that is, but my knee jerk would don't your listeners do not take this with anything more than a grain of salt, but my guess is it'd be some type of hippocampus-based memory. That's what I feel like. Uh, I feel like most of the studies that when, when you use a cognitive test that come out significant tend to be that learning and memory center. Maybe it's just because, you know, it's quick recall and memorization and things like that, but um, I was just it curious. Might, it might just be a more sensitive 
test to be fair. Like we would find a lot of, we would find reaction time to be pretty sensitive. So it, it might be something more to do with the test rather than the, the treatment per se, you know, like it might just be, there's greater power with that test. For so sure. it's not that the, it's not that the effect of testosterone that exists in these other domains of, of cognition, like executive function. It's just you'd need a larger end size to maybe see it. Because if you looked at that study for for like an epidemiological study, it was fairly low end size, I believe. I don't think, it, you know, they usually have like thousands of people. We had under a thousand in that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so, we're a, a little short on time. I want you to comment real quickly on the study. And, and actually, I, I found it semi-fascinating. The, the impact of Hayward green kiwi fruit, because I like kiwi fruit, on dietary protein digestion and protein metabolism. Like, uh, let's see, who is the lead author is Sanghee Park, and I guess yep. Robert Wolf Sr. Um, yeah. why, fruit, why, why, why kiwi, why? That was my question, why kiwi? Yeah, well, it has a, it has a, uh, uh, like a compound in it that helps break down like peptide bonds, like that whole, that whole shtick, right? Oh. And so, yeah, hydro, hydrogelase or whatever. I'm, I forget. It's like acti acti it starts with an A. I'm trying to remember the exact compound that kiwis have in it. But, you know, like, first off, there there's a company that sells kiwis that was, I think, interested in funding the study. So I was a postdoc when this happened. And this was already, like, I think, funded by the time I came on. Oh, here um, it is, David. Uh, I, I've i never heard of it. Actinidin protease? Actinidin? Yeah, I was close. I was close. I'll take it. Actinidin, yeah. I remember that. And, uh, you know, pineapple has them too, right? Oh, okay. so, yeah, pineapple has uh, like cysteine peptidases and stuff where it'll break down the cysteine bonds. But uh, yeah, it has that compound in it where it seems to help break down these these protein bonds and, and you know, you maybe get better bioavailability, right, was the idea. And so what's cool is that compound's available in green kiwi fruits, but it's not in gold kiwi fruits. So it made like a nice way to do a comparison. And um Long story short is that it didn't really affect anything at the muscle level, um, but we did see improvements in like the rate of appearance of phenylalanine. Mm -hmm. So the green kiwis got a, had a, a quicker appearance of, of phenylalanine into the blood as compared to the gold. But I believe over the entire five hour period, uh, it was ended up being a pretty similar uh, kinetic response between the two treatments. So it was a cool study. Um, it was kind of like fair warning to the viewers. It was kind of contrived because they had to eat like, four kiwis a day for two weeks and then come into the study and you eat the beef with the kiwi. So if, yeah. if we just saw something, the translatable, the translation would have been, yeah, if you eat kiwis every day, you get an enhanced response. That, that was, that's where I was going with that. Post-exercise yeah. kiwi with your chicken or beef yeah. in this case. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, it's not a bad source of, it's not a bad source of carbohydrates, you know? Hey, I want to let the audience know that they can find you on Twitter and they can, they can like harass you, Dr. Myohead, just so you know, Please um, do. Dr. Myohead. Yeah. Uh, tell cool. the audience what projects you have going on now. Hopefully we'll hear about some of this cool stuff next year at ISSN. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to finish, write that paper. Arnie's, Arnie's always on me about writing quicker. Uh, so if anyone's got any secrets, share with me on Twitter. Um, so I'm writing up the paper, the impossible burger. I, um, I'm actually uh, writing another paper about how the cessation of testosterone, the animals were given testosterone early in life, and then they were allowed to age and never given testosterone again for like seven months, which I forget my math. That's like 40 some years in a human or 20 some years in a human. And then we measured their, their rates of muscle protein synthesis after that. And then um, in terms of what's going on in the lab right now, we have some time restricted feeding studies going on and uh, looking at protein kinetics um, with time restricted feeding. And, um, and I did like the six verse 18, you know, um, I have one in review where we did, uh, kind of like it ended up being eight and a half just cause how long it takes older people to eat food. Um, but it was kind of like eight verse 16. Um, but we didn't have a, a normal diet comparator, but anyway, this, this study does. So we'll have a time restricted feeding group, different amount of protein, and then all that compared to like a regular dietary pattern. And then, um, trying to get some stuff going in uh, head and neck cancer. So really clinical based, ameliorating of stress states. Ameliorating. Katie, do you have any final thoughts or words for Dr. David Church? No, thanks for doing some really cool research. I, I love going to ISSN and hearing all the new things that you come up with. 
I am hoping to do research with you and Arnie, but um, you know. Yeah, email Arnie. Email, yeah. email Arnie. He's got a little bit more time than me right now. <laughs> well, Dr. Church, I want to thank you for appearing on Sports Science Dudes. I want to thank Katie for filling in as co-host for Tony Ricci. Uh, the podcast will be on YouTube, uh, Spotify, um, also on Rumble and App, uh, Apple Podcasts. So give it a couple of days, David. I'll make sure I tag you and I'll you come up with some really cool uh, tags so that everyone will like like send you emails and, and whatnot. And I'll get all the vegans to send you emails, especially. So yeah. I appreciate well, Thanks for having me. <laughs> appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.